morning. Welcome to Monrovia. Thank you for coming to be with us this morning. He is risen. We celebrate that every day. We join with the rest of the religious world this weekend. We celebrate that uh, especially this morning uh, as on our Easter morning. He is risen. We're so glad that you've come to be with us this morning. Let's all stand together and let's sing out. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong Oh, for love. 
Why not work? There we go. Good to see everybody. Got a lot of visitors with us today, and we're thankful for your presence. Uh, I know a lot of uh, folks are visiting with family and things like that, and we're, we're, we're glad you chose Monrovia to be a, the place that you spend with your family this morning. Some of you um, are, are members uh, uh, that, that maybe just haven't been here as often. We would encourage you to use the motivation from today to make Sunday with Monrovia more of a uh, tradition with you. Maybe you're here in... Uh, just the weekly church attendance or relationship with people in a church isn't a part of your life. We encourage you to think about that also today. We're going to be talking about uh, miracles, uh, the, the, the miracle of the resurrection today, uh, Easter. That's where a lot of minds are focused, and uh, so that theme will carry us out. I want to start, though, by bringing uh, the young folks down front. If you're visiting with us, we always get the kids down front. For just a few minutes uh, before we move on with the remainder of our service, I need all y'all to come up here, okay? We're going we're gonna to do a picture this morning. How would that be? Wow. Lots of kids. Isn't that right? So what I need you to do is stand up. Everybody stand up here and look out that way so I can get your picture. All right? Okay, big guys in the back. How about that? If you're, don't be hogging the front. Get the big guys in the back, some of the little ones in the front. I just thought with everybody all dressed up, y'all stand up and face me. Now I need, where is Michael Moretti? No, Michael Moretti. Where is Michael? Do what? Yeah, come on up here. Michael, come on up. I said, we're going to focus on miracles. Kids, are they're just miracles all by themselves. But we got one that's uh, sort of special among us, and that's little Michael. And he came dressed like the preacher today. Y'all, look, check this out. Will you come to me? We, look, check out Michael. Doesn't he look like the preacher man? All right. And for those of you that don't know, Michael's had, uh, he's had some tough issues over life. And uh, early in his life, it, it was, you know, uh, hanging in the balance to a degree. So, uh, like, he, he's one of our miracles that we're happy with. Would you stand right in the front while we take a picture? Would you do that, Michael? Here. Will you stand right there? Look out. Okay. There you go. Now, I'm, all right. Now, get your picture made. He's looking to go somewhere. There you go. All right. Was that fun? Now, the thing I love to do with the kids is give them sugar. So we have, what, I brought you all some cotton candy, all right? And here's what you do with it is you take it and you give it to your mom and dad, and they get to decide when you eat it or if you eat it. How's that? All right? All right. Grab one. I knew that was going to happen. Just one. Just one. There you go. You. All right, everybody get one? Did you get one? Do what now? All right. Mickey's at it now. All right. I already have one. You already have one? Did you get one? I'm always afraid of what Ray's going to do because I always have to follow it. But uh, right. try to restore order Did you get one? sometimes. And this morning is one of those times. Right. But we're going to do change for Jesus. So. If you have some loose change that you would like to huh? give this morning, our children are going to get some cups, and they'll be coming around collecting that. So don't give your cotton candy away, now, but just go and collect. All right, we need to be sure that we spread over and cover this side of the auditorium as well as this side. If you have something to give, if you would hold, hold up your hand, that might help our children find their way. Okay, go go right over this way. You know, I guess 40. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. And today, all right, some, today is third Sunday, so we have Children's Church in the back. So after we finish um, Change for Jesus, those up through kindergarten are dismissed to the back for Children's Church. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me when I'm good, when I do the things I should. Jesus loves me when I'm bad, but it makes him very sad. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I love Jesus, does he know? Do I often tell him so? Jesus loves to hear me say that I love him every day. Yes, I love Jesus. Yes, I love Jesus. Yes, I love Jesus. I often tell him so. Is my mic going in and out, or, or am I, is my hearing going in and out? It's one, it's one of the two. All right. We'll give them just another moment to, to get the change collected in the back and then head to Children's Church. Okay, let's sing. Low in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph.
He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. The prophet Isaiah lived in the seventh century before Christ. His prophecies about the servant of God gave him the title, the Messianic prophet. Luke records that after Jesus' temptation, he returned to his hometown, Nazareth, and went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. He unrolled the scroll of Isaiah to the text that we know as Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. It reads, The Spirit of the Lord, the Sovereign Lord, is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from the darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, handed it to the attendant, and sat down. As the other men looked at him, he said to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This comment led to an intense discussion that caused him to be rejected in his hometown. An attempt was made to kill him. He miraculously walked through the crowd and went on his way. Just as Jesus explained to his people that they had rejected the Father during the days of Elijah, they were likewise blind to who he was, the Anointed One of God. Paul wrote the following in Romans 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was God's plan that Jesus give his body for us on the cross to atone for our sins. Let's pray. Father, how great a sacrifice your son Jesus made for us to suffer suffer a cruel death on the cross, to be flogged, to be beaten, to be spat upon. We're so thankful that, that he left us a way to remember the sacrifice he made that us a body, a life without sin would be represented by the bread that we're about to partake, which represents his body. It's unleavened without sin. Thank you for sending him. Help us now to participate in this with great faith and trust in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
The well-known passage in Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, uh, t- verse 12, or the chapter of 53, is well known to most of us in that, as and many other references to the Messiah, gave Isaiah the, the name, the Messianic prophet. Part of that passage, it's a rather long one, but I'd like to read to you, beginning in verse 7 of chapter 53. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a a lamb to the slaughter, and his sheep before his shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of us... In, this gener- in his generation protested, for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he has done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. It's interesting that John the baptizer, when he saw Jesus coming to him to be baptized, said, Behold the Lamb of God. And then the day after, As Jesus passed by, John was standing with two of his disciples and made the same statement. Jesus is the the Passover lamb that was slain for us. Paul would later write to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15 and say, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I have received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of our brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still with us uh, today, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all to me as one born abnormally. The resurrection is not a fairy tale or a fable. Jesus was seen by tens of thousands during his ministry and hundreds after his resurrection. Believing Jesus is is the risen Savior and accepting him as the Lord of our lives is a matter of who we want to put on the throne. We choose to put him on the throne. Let's pray. Father, this cup represents the blood of your son, Jesus, who willingly went to the cross and gave his life for us so that it might atone for our sins and all of us have sinned. Thank you for providing a way out, for, for buying us back, and adopting us into your family. Help us as we partake of this cup to remember that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
The passage that I read in the beginning from Isaiah 61 has a very sobering thought in it about that he came to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and to release from darkness the prisoners. We were all, we were all prisoners of darkness, but yet the Father sent his best as a ransom for us, and the Son gave his best as a ransom for us in giving his life. It is their nature to be givers. All of us have so much to be thankful for, often not realizing each day how many things that bless our lives and help us, guide us, teach us, give us peace, give us hope and faith. Help us to be willing to share in the work that Jesus started as we give today. And let's pray. Father, bless this offering that we would give our best, that we would give gladly to help others to teach the world the good news to share the good news by the way we talk and live the things that we do might glorify your name we pray that our offering might glorify your name as well we pray this in jesus name amen This is our third Sunday, so we have uh, class for our first through third graders now. So those of you that are in first through third grade can be dismissed to the back uh, for your children's church. Now let's all stand together and sing out. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Hear the holy roar of God resound. The waters part before us now. Watch the waters part before us now. Come, Come and see what he has done for us. Tell the world of his great love. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God. God 
is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God morning again. All right, uh, after services today, we've got lunch prepared. We'd love for you to stay and eat, and then also the kids are going to be doing an Easter egg hunt. We had asked uh, people to bring in eggs. If you brought some in and you have them with you and uh, didn't leave them out front, if you'll take them to Brian back there, uh, now if you'll get them back there, they're going to do some things with them and have it all ready for the Easter egg hunt later on. All right. So we're going we're gonna to really just have one point to the lesson, but it'll take us a, a little bit to get there at the end. I hope you'll, you'll stay engaged with me throughout it as we uh, get there, uh, and I hope you'll find the, the point we're going to make encouraging for you in your life. Now, I really thought hard about whether I was going to actually introduce the lesson this way. And I know already some of you, after... I introduced the lesson in, in, you know, with the Auburn, Alabama theme. 
are going to be gone. Mentally, you will be gone. Some of you will be relishing in, you know, the, the greatness of your team. Others will be devastated because of frustration associated with your team, and you'll just be gone. So there's two opportunities here. One is to get a point from the lesson. The other is to see how quickly you can get over an emotional high or low, depending on what that is. So you get to practice a lot of things. But y'all know, every year, Alabama and Auburn come together for the Iron Bowl, right? It's a big game, big deal, and uh, if you're not from Alabama... Uh, or you didn't grow up as a big Alabama-Auburn fan, you, you, you don't understand, I guess, some of the significance, but most of you understand a real sports rivalry, and, and you've been around long enough, you, you know the deal. And last couple of years, uh, really last three or four years, been really pretty good for uh, Auburn, I mean, Alabama football. Uh, Auburn had a national championship, had a good year too, but you know, the Iron Bowl this year, coming into the Iron Bowl, Alabama ranked number one in the nation, had been all year, they're, they're up, they're uh, you know, got all kinds of uh, opportunity, really, to win a third national championship and blah, blah, blah. Right. And the game starts, and it goes on, and it's pretty good. You know, it's really a, an exciting ball game. And even at the end, some people say it may go down as one of the best college football games ever played. But now, I, I'm not trying to assign a, a evil or good to either program, all right? In fact, I thought I could get away with this because I have always been an Alabama fan, and I'm going to sort of assign the evil side to Alabama, all right? So uh, take that as it be, but you know how it is. They're winning. You know, they've been winning a couple of years, a couple of national championships, and in the game, they're really, in a lot of ways, winning the game. Now, you know, you might be an Auburn fan saying, no, I mean, Auburn was in there. But, but Alabama really was, in, in a lot of ways, controlling the game. They just couldn't control the scoreboard. You know, they had, uh, you know, opportunities to score, missed field goals. They had uh, some first down opportunities, driving the ball, all that stuff. So the point I'm trying to make here, and, and what I want you to remember is, a lot of times in life, Things go sort of as you would expect them to, but every once in a while there is that miracle. And in our lives, in a relationship with God, we really have the opportunity to see that miracle repeated often. So in this game, Alabama had taken a 28-21 lead. They had a couple of chances to tack on an extra score that would have really put the game probably out of reach. Uh, they miss those. Auburn ends up with the ball, you know, with a little over two minutes in the game. They come down, they score, and they tie it up 28-28. Alabama's got the ball. I can't remember how much time. There's 30 seconds or something like that left. And they drive down, and you know the deal. They decide to go for this long field goal. 28-28. Nobody really expects them to make the field goal. Everybody in their mind is expecting what? 28-28, tie, ball game's over, and we're going to overtime. And then what happens? Video to Joe. He said, you're really going to show that at church on Easter? <laughs> I said, yeah, I mean, I thought it would be great, don't you? And uh, he didn't really think so, maybe. But that is, as you know, one of the things we've witnessed and are familiar with that is a totally unexpected outcome, isn't it? I mean, nobody would have expected that to have been the outcome. I also love the fact they put the picture of, now I, I told you, I'm an Alabama fan and I have and I like, uh, you know, what's going on in the program, all that stuff, but, but it'd be hard to have a better picture than Coach Saban's face right after that because it is a, like, what just happened? Well, man, is that not the face that we want, or the facial expression that you want to put on Satan and his demons as you walk through life? When they think they've got you, when they think they're controlling the situation, when they think they are about to take hold of this victory, somehow in a miraculous way, you come out on the other side that leaves them just like looking, wow, what just happened? 
I'm telling you, there's a power available because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that can give you that opportunity in life. And that's what we want to think about. You know the story. Jesus came to the earth. He came to live as a man. In fact, his name, Emmanuel, that's what it, one of the things it means is, is God with us. God leaving heaven to come and spend time with us as one of us. And the story of the, the, the life of Jesus is not really debated you, you know, we've talked about it before. You, you read it in the Bible. You can read it in history books. You can read a number of places. A man lived named Jesus Christ. Not only did he live, he was charged with being, uh, you know, a, a rebellious to the Roman Empire and even to the Jewish people of which he was one of them and to their traditions and their religion. And eventually, in an effort to uh, quieten him and those of his followers, he was taken and he was crucified, and he was buried, and now nobody knows where he is. Well, we do because Scripture tells us, but those that would want to quiet him can't find him, and there's no really good explanation other than he was raised just as he said he would be. All right, you know the story. Now, what I want you to think about with me for a few minutes is what happened when Jesus left heaven and when he came to earth, there, there was like, it's like an indescribable collision, this between God and man. How can you be all man and be all God at the same time, right? And it, it's called a uh, hypnostatic uh, is one of the words associated with it that uh, you learn back when you're going through school and stuff, uh, you know, like in a theology school or something. It doesn't really sound very pretty or anything, but it really is the description of how somebody could be all man and all God at the same time. And we don't really understand it. I'm not going to try to tell you over the next few minutes. I completely understand it. But what I want you to think about with me is that for Jesus to be all man like we are, to be wrapped in flesh and to experience trials and struggles that he could relate to us as he said that he can, he would have had to have le left part of God in heaven. You know, 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says, It is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that's referring to Jesus, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The intent, and now we know that God knew it wouldn't work out, but with Adam, when he was in the garden and he had the uh, relationship with God, and this could have gone on forever, that would have been what God wanted, his relationship with man forever. That didn't work out, so then he sent the second Adam. So Jesus was the only other man that ever lived without sin, right? First Adam lived without sin until... Through Eve and through Adam, sin was introduced to the world because of the temptation of Satan. Now Jesus comes along, and he's the second Adam. He's the second man to live without sin, yet Jesus maintained that for his life. And what he was able then to bring to earth was this life-giving spirit that God had always intended so you could have this relationship with God. And it's just so uh, valuable for what he puts in front of us. Now, what I want us to focus on for just a minute is this idea, this thought of Jesus coming to earth and leaving part of himself, emptying, emptying himself, if you would view it that way, of a part of what he was in heaven when he came here to live. All right? You know what it means to empty yourself of something? Did make sense? I, I do that when Christy and I go eat or we go shopping or something. I empty myself. I take my billfold out of my pocket and I leave it at home. That way when we're up to the checkout, she says, Ray, you know, got your billfold? I, no, I left it at home. You know, it doesn't mean I don't have the capability. I just don't have it with me. So now she gets to do it. That, that, that emptying himself. It doesn't mean at any point Jesus didn't have the capability of being all God, but he made a decision to empty himself while he was here among us, so he could live among us and relate to us and then offer us a picture example of how we can walk through life. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, it says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality of God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he what? He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. 
being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This, the, the Greek word there is kenosis. This is this ideal of him not being God, but being all man. Now, he's still God, and we understand that, and we see that, but, but in many ways, he was, as you are, wrapped in flesh, and he had emptied himself of some of that. Now, what, this, be, this is really important, all right, uh, to understand how he had to live his life, because if he had to go through life much the same way we have to go through life, then it would be valuable to learn how he was successful in watching what he did, right? But now, if he could just always play the trump card, the God card, then he had an advantage that you don't have, or that I don't have. Isn't that right? Does that make sense? Okay? You get it? Because we can think, well, you know, Jesus was able to do all things, because, you know, anytime he got in a bind, he just played that, well, I'm God. You don't understand? I'm God. I'm God. Well, he left that part of him up there. So he had to access this power and this understanding of God's will as he walked through life the same way you do. In the same way I do. You remember Luke chapter 2, verse 52? We've studied this verse before and talked about it, and we, we've talked about it as Jesus grew physically, right? But what does it say right before it says he grew physically? He also grew in what? He grew in what? Stay with me, folks. He grew in what? If you are all God, how can you grow in wisdom? Answer me. Right? If you're all God, how can you grow in wisdom? God would have all wisdom, wouldn't he? He's all-knowing. Isn't that what we say? Well, only if he had emptied himself of part of that would he be able to be in a state to where he could grow in wisdom, right? Make sense? Just as he physically grew, he grew in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding just like we do. This is really important because then when you go into the, you know, each of the Gospels talks about uh, really focuses on a different part of Jesus' life. The book of Luke is really a, an interesting one because it, it, it focuses a lot on his relationship with his father and how Jesus understood and followed the will of his father. And oftentimes before Jesus had a decision to make or a life choice, you would see in the book of Luke over and over and over, he would go alone and he would pray. Why? To seek the will of of the Father, to seek His will, just like He wants us to do, right? When you have life decisions, life choices, major things coming out there, what do you need to do? You need to spend some time with the Father seeking His will in your life. That's an example. It's a picture of what Jesus gave us. You know, there was also this that was interesting. Matthew 3, 16, 17, as soon as Jesus was baptized, what happened? He went up out of the water, that moment, heaven opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him, what? Like a dove, and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I love, and him I am well pleased. What was this dove that descended down and alighted on him? It's the same Spirit of God that you can have in you, right? So, just from that, we could develop that pretty deep. We're not going to. We've got a lot to accomplish today. It's Easter. You've got family time. So, just take it. You can go research it. You can go read it and study it more. There's two principles that are important to understand. Jesus found his direction in his life, not from the fact that he was God, but from a relationship with God, his Father. That's how he found his direction. All right? Not only that, Jesus found the power to do the will of the Father from God the Holy Spirit. Not from... Like I said, playing the trump card, I am God. He learned the direction from God the Father, understanding his will. He had the power to fulfill that in his life because the Spirit of God, God the Holy Spirit, was with him. Now, what's so key about that? We can have the same thing. We can have the very same thing. Look at it at the end of his life. You know the final week of Jesus. You, you've, you've read it. You've studied it. It, it, it is so amazing, that, that final week. But on Thursday night, on Thursday night, he's read the prophecies. He understands his position. And he goes, like Luke over and over talks about him doing, he goes into the garden, and he is seeking to understand his Father's will. 
You know this verse very well. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. I know we've, we've attached, and I think rightly so, a lot of understanding to that verse that Jesus was submitting himself to his Father's will. I think, again, in this, it's like much of Jesus' life, he is admitting that I, I, don't, I, I don't really look to tomorrow and know exactly how all this is going to turn out. That's a part of what I emptied myself from. You know, there's another passage in Scripture. Remember when it talks about uh, wanting to know when the second coming will be? And he said what? He said, I don't know. He's God. How does he not know? I, I don't know that this is all that it means, but, but I think it's interesting. And to me, I think there's a likelihood there that that's a part of what he had emptied him. So he's saying, as I answer the question right now with you, I don't know. I don't have all of that in me as I once did. I've emptied myself of that. It makes sense. Now, the Father knows, and I have no doubt today, you know, maybe, maybe he knows. But, but he's saying that here, just like he is in the garden, I am subjecting myself, I am submitting myself, I guess, to the will of the Father, whatever that might be. And I'm going to need the strength because he's going to rely on the Spirit to get through that. Now, you know, then he's taken around 9 a.m. in the morning. He's nailed to the cross, and for the next six hours, Jesus' physical body dies. Excruciating. Uh, you know, we, we can't really imagine the horror associated with that death. And following that death, he's taken off the cross, he's laid into a tomb, and they think it's over. But what happens? You know. Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 19 and 21, but this part of the scripture said, that power is the same, we're going to talk about that power, but that power is the same as a mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. A power that could take Jesus after a death on the cross and raise him back to life, would you not like to have the ability to access that same power? Let me ask you this. You have some difficulties in life. You have some character traits, some behaviors. You have... Some, some things that have really come in and taken over your life. You have some relationship struggle. Whatever it is, you think right now, what is the toughest thing that I am personally dealing with? I want to ask you, do you believe the power that brought a dead body out of a tomb that Jesus was in, his body, do you think the power that would have brought that body back to life can help you get through whatever you're dealing with? What do you think? Think of the worst thing you're encountering now that you would love just to find a way through it. That same power, do you think it can do something for you? Because that's the message of the resurrection. That's the message of an opportunity for a relationship with God, is it not? To be able to look at my life, be able to look at what happened. Now, I understand the, the salvation that's offered and the blood gift. I understand all that, but there is something beyond and even greater. I won't say greater, but, but right alongside with that, and that is this message that that same power that he had to be raised can help you with your biggest and your smallest of struggles, whatever they are, it is there for you. Ephesians chapter 1 Verse 13 and 14 says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. What is that seal? The Holy Spirit. And what do we say earlier? You, you learn the will of the Father by getting to know the Father. And then you have the power, the same power, that can live within you, that lived in him, that can give you the ability to move through it. That's a pretty awesome message that God's trying to get to us. He said the Spirit is deposited, guaranteeing what? Our inheritance of the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Now I want you to look at this. A little bit later in that same passage, in this passage, uh, the, the uh, passage we talked about with the same power, is right in this prayer that Paul offers for all of us. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may do what? 
So there's, there's a couple of things in spirit that he wants us to have, and we can have access to this. It's going to do a couple of things. You know what's the first one it says? I want you to have this so you can do what? Know him what? Know him better so I can know him better. What's the value of knowing him better? Because then I know what it is he would want me to do. You know, oftentimes I hear people say, I've even said, you know, and I just wish in this situation, I wish, wish God would just send me a postcard or something telling me what to do. Well, he's really given me the opportunity to know what to do by having the opportunity to know him. Because if I really do know him, I really would pretty much know what to do. Don't you think? We all think. Stay with me. I'm about done. We're going to eat. But stay with me for just a second. If I really knew him, if I really knew him, don't you think I would have a pretty good idea of what direction to take? All right. Spencer's with us today. And Glenn, I got Brittany over here and Spencer. The, the two, my children, you know, they, they've lived with me all, all, all my life. So let me ask this, and I'll ask them. If I were to buy, go this afternoon and get like a, a case of water, you know, like 24, 36 bottles of water, and I take it home to put it in the refrigerator, will I just take that whole box and stick it in there, or do you think I will undo those individually, make sure all the labels are facing toward the front, and line them all up individually? Which way would I put the water in the refrigerator? The first way or the second way? Second, second way. Uh, what about this? Do you think I would rather clean, wash and clean a smelly, stinky, dirty, filthy car or stand in line for one hour? What do you think? Wash the car. Hmm. Would I rather drive to Birmingham two hours away if they had just built the absolute best Mexican restaurant that has ever been made in the world, drive two hours to Birmingham and eat it, or drive 15 minutes across town and eat at Mullins? Mullins. I, I could go on and on. Guess what? Every question I ask, what do you think? They would get it right. Why? They know me. They've watched me. They've lived with me. I could get into even some harder questions, and you know what? For the most part, they would get them right. It would be, it would be really rare to see them not get one because they would just pull on the history of experience. And they would answer the question based on that. So here's the deal, folks. When you're saying, well, I just wish I knew what God wanted me to do. If you have an experience of relationship with him, you will pretty much know what he wants you to do. Don't you think? Because you will know what he would do. You would know how he would respond. And you would just call on that. And then you would act on it. So God wants you to have this same power so you can have this relationship with God so you can walk through life knowing that I, I really am in the will of God. Just like I said a minute ago, if they walked in the house and they saw the water sitting there from the grocery store and they wanted to put it in the refrigerator in a way that if I came and opened the door that Daddy would be happy, they know exactly how to put it in there. Right? Right? You want to know how to make God happy, have a relationship with him, then you really won't struggle through many situations because you'll know what to do. You'll know, okay, I go do this. God will be happy. And beyond that, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power, we noticed already, is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rules and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. You can have, you know, the Old Testament, I love so many stories of the Old Testament, and we could get deep into it. We're not. Just, just go with me for just a minute. Because so many things in the Old Testament are like a shadow of what it's going to be like in the future. It's giving you a picture of this is what it'll be like. And you know the story when the children of Israel have been in Egyptian bondage, and then uh, Moses comes along and, and leads them out. You know, you know the whole story, the plagues, and all, all that deal. They've been there for so long, that's really all they knew. They're going out, and then as they're leaving, Pharaoh is re looking, and he says, oh my goodness, there goes all my free labor. They're leaving, and I, I know I agreed to let them go, but I can't do that. I got to go get them, and they come up. You know, the children of Israel come up. It's Moses reading them, leading them. They come up to the sea, and they need a way across the sea, and he asks for God's blessing there. Y'all know, and right, the, the sea parts. They cross on dry land, and then what happens? And here's the picture. This is so pretty. What happens? 
Then Pharaoh and his folks, they're all in there, right? And then God lets the walls that were holding the water be removed, however that happened, and now it's all swallowed up. You know the story. You learned it as a young kid in Bible class. But here is the picture of that. This is the power of what takes place in what we're talking about now. That is the picture of what can happen in your life when you come to salvation in Christ, right? You have determined, I believe in God. I'm going to name Jesus as my Savior. I believe in the resurrection message. I believe in salvation that's offered by him. Then you get to go into the watery graves as we, you know, we draw the picture. You get to be baptized. You get to be raised up. But here's what happens when you're baptized. Not only, it, it is like, I'm telling you folks, it is like that field goal at the end of the game. It really is. There's not much chance of anybody taking that ball back and running 100 yards with a clock expired and coming out victorious on the other side. There's not much of a chance of that happening. There's not much of a chance of you not only having all your sin from that moment and past removed, forgiven, forgotten, but not only that, all the demons that have been attacking you, the difficulty in relationship, the difficulty financial struggles, you know, with with managing things, managing opportunities, the things that have been taking over my life, the addictions, all those struggles, all that stuff, right? All that stuff, okay? Because when you go into that picture, you going from Egyptian bondage to the other side, headed to Canaan's land, headed to the promised land. That is like all the sin from present day and in the past. That's what God let those waters take over, right? Pharaoh's army in there, that's all those things that are attacking you. That's all that stuff that is trying to get a hold of you. Those waters didn't just get rid of your sin. It took all that stuff too and killed it, right? How? The same power. The same power that raised Jesus from the grave can fix all of that in your life. Do y'all believe that? Okay. The same power. I said I had one message for you. What do you think it is? What do you think it is? Put a picture up. I thought I could. Maybe I'm punching wrong, but I had one message for you. Resurrection Sunday is a picture of your ability to access that power. So, here's how we're going to close today. I want you to say it with me. Same power. power. Folks, y'all can tell these are a bunch of Church of Christers. (laughs) Isn't that right? I mean, they grew up Church of Christ. They know Church of Christ. That's all they know. All right? Same power. Say it like a Baptist would. Same power. <laughs> all right. Now say it like more like a Presbyterian or a Methodist would. All right? Same power. All right. Now stand up and say it like a Pentecostal would. All right? Stand up. Stand up. All right? And say, hold your hands up and say, same power. Same power. Man, is that not bad? Much, much better than the first way you did it. I'm telling you, there's power, there's power. The same power can be in your life if you choose to go get it, all right? So don't just sit there like a knot on the log. Yeah, same power, God. I mean, how about accepting it into your life and allowing it to work? He will work for you. There's a peace I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail, there's an anchor for my soul. I can say it is well. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed.
I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed that video uh, this morning. Uh, no, seriously, uh, what a great reminder this morning of the power of God and how it's available to each and every one of us. We're so glad that each and every one of you uh, chose to be here this morning with us. Uh, we want you to stay and eat lunch with us. You can see the, uh, the menu there on your screen. Um, so uh, please stick around for that. Uh, also a reminder, our food pantry, um, we are collecting vegetables uh, this month in particular. Uh, so each time you come in, 
be sure to grab a couple from your pantry or pick up a couple when you're in the store. Uh, also, after lunch today, uh, stay around for our Easter egg hunt. As you can see on the screen, it's for toddlers uh, to fifth grade. And uh, if you have your eggs, you can give them to Brian. Hopefully that's already been taken care of, and I think they were out there working on getting that set up already. Um, this evening, just a reminder that we will be having classes as usual uh, for tonight. Uh, for, the, for the young folks, for the youth group, we are going to come down and help out uh, as we prepare for uh, the closet, the free shopping day uh, that's coming up. That'll be in your next slide. Um, I just want to encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, it's coming up Saturday, the 26th. Um, if you ever heard of Bob Goff, he wrote a book called Love Does. Um, and I, one of the things that he, he talks about a lot is um, this concept of a Bible study. And he's always confused by what a Bible study is. He says he would rather go do a, have a Bible doing. And that's what I think of when I see, uh, when, when, when I participate in the closet, uh, the free shopping days. What we're doing is a Bible doing. Uh, we're going out and spreading God's love to the people uh, in this community. So I encourage you uh, to come to our Bible doing uh, this, this coming Saturday. And if you can have a chance to help out throughout the week, uh, set up for that as well. Uh, the men's prayer breakfast is coming up on May 3rd. That's at 8 o'clock, and uh, Danny Pettis will be the speaker. Um, with the youth group, uh, we specifically want to mention um, uh, camp. It's, it's coming up real soon, June 6th through 11th. Uh, we need you to get your applications in as soon as possible. Um, I have some printed out up here. I will leave up here on the table if you want to come get, come get one. I have about 20 copies here, but you can also download one from mygonline.org. So go there if you don't get a, a hand, hand of one of these. And, uh, but grab one, fill it out. Uh, we have a limited number of spots for camp, so get those applications in as soon as possible. And uh, that's the announcements we have. Would you rise? <laughs> Thank you for being with us this morning, and uh, we ask each to be blessed as God has blessed us through his uh, resurrection covering our sins with his blood and, and uh, showing us that we can resurrect as well, and we have. Yeah. Bow with me, please. Father, thank you for giving us this uh, um, resurrection, uh, being uh, made new again in you. Uh, thank you for recreating us to now serving you uh, through our lives and, and providing others the uh, story of your love, the, uh, the cleansing power of your son's death on the cross and resurrection. And we pray that we might believe and put faith and trust in you, Father, and, and in your son, that as we live life each day, that we might uh, just cherish the spirit that you've placed within us to give us the power to overcome our difficulties, our troubles in life, and that we might share with each other that uh, new hope that we have of being with you in eternity and the hope that we can have here as we live out each day. Thank you for this uh, wonderful group that's here this morning and for the Christians, for those that are thinking about becoming Christians, for those that are just uh, learning about you, Father. Help us to be uh, of uh, influence to each other, that we might just uh, enjoy life, enjoy each other through your son's resurrection. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.